economics in Europe. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to our event. Um, of course, um, healthcare is a very important topic for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, of course, we care about being healthy, right? So, so uh, each of us has a, has a strong interest in that. But of course, um, we also care about it uh, in the sense that um, uh, it is, on the one hand, a significant item on uh, spending, public finance spending, usually public spending, but also there's, all, of course, a lot of private spending, household spending on, on health care. So it is macroeconomically a relevant uh, spending item. Um, but, of course, it's also a, a relevant item for uh, more long-term questions, growth questions, um, and so on, because, you know, healthy societies, healthy populations are more productive, um, can work longer. I mean, working life uh, is, of course, um, uh, a very important factor um, uh, determining, determining our long-term, I mean, the length uh, of our working life is a very important part of our, our future in an aging society. So, so health is an, is an integral part of that, and um, that's why I think it's very interesting, very important that we, we have this event today and to discuss various aspects around, around this, these questions. Now, it's my um, pleasure um, to uh, welcome Xavier Pratz-Monet. Uh, he's the Director General of uh, DG uh, Santé, I guess, um, um, in, uh, in the European Commission. Um, he will um, start the, uh, the workshop with, uh, with an opening statement. After that, um, uh, with an opening keynote. After that, we will have a shorter presentation by Bruegel uh, Senior Fellow uh, Joel Davash, uh, who will talk about some aspects of the macroeconomic implications uh, of healthcare, and I think looking more sort of at the public finance angle, where you know people tend to very much look always at the cost side, especially in the program countries. That was, of course, a major major item where spending was also cut, really. I mean, in Greece and so on, um, in in the times of austerity. But I think there's also the growth and the productivity side that we, of course, also need to look at. And Jolt will, will present a bit, a bit of his recent research findings. And uh, following um, Jolt's presentation, we will have a panel discussion uh, with uh, Caroline Kostongs, director from Euro Healthnet. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, per Eckfeld um, here on my left. Um, he is the uh, deputy head of unit at DG Eckfin, so I guess he will bring in the public finance um, aspects. Uh, uh, Sylvain uh, Giraud, um, he is um, the head of unit um, in DG Santé uh, that has written the report um, also that um, uh, Xavier will present. And uh, last but not least, uh, Petra Lauks from Novartis um, will give the perspective uh, from uh, a leading, leading pharma company. So without uh, much further ado, thank you so much, Xavier, you. for, for kicking in. Off. Gunther, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good morning or rather good afternoon, uh, almost everybody. Um, you know, it, it's such a pleasure to be here because, uh, well, first of all, my colleagues and I, Sylvain and his team in the first place, we have, we have put so much effort for <laughs> such a long time on this product that uh, it's always a pleasure to present it. But I also have a more personal reason because, you know, I, I've come here to Bruegel several times and I always come believing and thinking that I'm not one of the usual suspects of Bruegel because I work now in health but before in education and before that in employment, which are three areas where there is precious little regulatory power at the European Union level, and yet it's very difficult to argue that this issue should not be dealt with at the European level. And this, this uh, dilemma uh, of having an area that is, has many implications, including macroeconomic implications, but an area where the EU doesn't have that much power is really, really a challenge uh, to, to look at the added value of the EU especially if you define added value in a serious way as the Juncker College does, which is whatever has to be done at the European level because it cannot be done elsewhere. Uh, so uh, both in terms of, I hope, what I'll be able to show, which is the product we have coming up with, and in terms of the topic and the context of the usual people who listen to the Bruegel uh, uh, events, I hope that this will be interesting. And in any case, I'm delighted to be here. I, I should also apologize because I won't be able to say all along. Uh, I'll have to leave uh, sometime after Zoltan's presentation, but, but Sylvain, who knows all these topics much better than me, will be here, of course, with you. Now, 
Let me start just with a few words precisely on uh, the uh, case for health and, and uh, <laughs> health care. Maybe not. That puts the end to my presentation, I guess. All right. So, so, this, so how do you do that? <laughs> okay. So All right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So briefly. Um, let me put it this way. Uh, health is uh, already in the menu of the EU, and I'm sure our colleague from uh, ECFIN will say more about this. Uh, finance ministers have no trouble talking about health from a macroeconomic perspective, from a fiscal responsibility perspective. What I think would be interesting is to make sure that, ha that health is not just on the menu, but also at the table. And that is really the case for health that has to be made. And it should be easy to do so, because if you look at health, uh, it, there is an extraordinarily uh, it's an extraordinarily heavy sector in terms of uh, labor intensiveness, as you can see here. It's, a it's an area where there's a lot of uh, intense research and uh, innovation uh, practice, and this will be increasingly so. And of course, there are huge implications in terms of human capital and productivity, and indeed inequality. I, I often uh, quote something that really, really impressed me, which is this, uh, this uh, study by the London City, by the way, that shows you that if you take the London tube at Westminster, the Jubilee line eastwards, every tube stop, life expectancy decreases by one year. Now that's a pretty striking uh, uh, statement because it shows how connected healthcare, uh, education, income, social exclusion are, and therefore how it is difficult not to look at healthcare if you care about social policy in general and indeed the sustainability of our fiscal systems. Um, Never mind the fact that uh, uh, healthcare is one of those areas where the key trends of our societies are showing more and will show in a more dramatic way. Technology, of course, I mean, everybody knows how, how quickly technology advances. We now know, for example, that you have an algorithm that can have a better diagnostics of a melanoma than any human being, which is a pretty striking uh, illustration of the potential of of uh, technology in science. And then, of course, demography. I mean, uh, uh, the only part of the demographic pyramid that grows in Europe is the one above 85 years of age. Hmm. And this has extraordinary implications for, for example, the profile of ep uh, ep epidemics, uh, epidemiology in Europe, because multimorbidity, chronic diseases take a far stronger place than before. So you have a sector that is very relevant in the economies of Europe, and at the same time, a sector that is going to be transformed with the challenges and the potential that this uh, implies. Now, let's take a look at uh, the economic uh, uh, aspects of healthcare. And, and in a way, if I had to define what my job is, very often I feel that my job consists of talking about health in a way that the finance minister understands, which is interesting because this means actually a, a pretty blunt reality that I experience every day, which is in many cases, I don't want to <coughs> mention names, in many cases, health ministers don't see their role like that. It is a very little participation of health <coughs> stakeholders and health ministries in the macroeconomic debate of the member states, and therefore even less so at European level. But this is just an illustration uh, of how you can present healthcare and health policy from an economic perspective. You have 550,000 people in Europe of working age who die prematurely because of a chronic disease. That means simply 3.4 million productive years lost, and you see the figures there of what this means in terms of Europe GDP. And the contrast is that 80% of uh, uh, costs in healthcare systems come from chronic diseases, and yet only 3% are devoted to prevention. The uh, level of expenditure is devoted to prevention. So, so you have here a pretty strong, and, and if you look at the potential for more effective spending in healthcare. There's a, 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 a systematic review of public health interventions uh, study done in 2017, this year, that shows that the uh, median return of investment on investment of 14.2 to one on healthcare expenditure. So the potential to do more and better mm -hmm. is, is very high. Now, yeah, this is a, another look at this. The health expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Uh, the biggest expense, government spend after pensions, and a huge discrepancy 
of expenditure, both in absolute and relative terms. By the way, 9.9% uh, of GDP uh, expenditure means about 2,800 euro per capita uh, per year. That's the average. It's government expenditure. Government, yeah, sorry. Government, yes, yeah. So uh, is there a connection between expenditure and effectiveness? Well, this is, it doesn't show very well, but the horizontal column is amenable mortality, that is, unnecessary deaths. So people who die and who shouldn't die in a normally functioning healthcare system. So not people who die of pancreatic cancer, but people who die, for example, at childbirth. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an intolerable type of death. And the vertical column uh, gives you the, the, the statistics on health expenditure per capita. And you see that there is a correlation with money. Yeah? If you look at the horizontal column, I mean, the, the less you spend, in a way, the more you have animal deaths. So if you look here, Latvia, the worst performing country, you have very low expenditure per capita, but very high animal deaths. But then look here at, uh, for example, Luxembourg and Italy, Cyprus, Spain. You have very similar animal deaths and extremely different uh, mortality rates. And if you look, something is not here in this table, but I can give you by heart a figure that really strikes me. Look at maternal mortality rates. So the number of women who die either during pregnancy or six weeks after pregnancy. Uh, take Poland and Luxembourg. Poland is at three per 100,000, very low, very low. Like Finland, like uh, Sweden, like Germany, like Italy. Luxembourg is slightly higher, seven per 100,000, but it spends 10 times more than Poland per capita in healthcare. So there is a connection with money but money is not just everything, and the good news is that we know that policy can make a huge uh, difference. Now, uh, let me say a few words about what we're presenting here today. Uh, we thought that uh, there is, if it's true, and we don't dispute that, that we should not be telling countries what to do in terms of the organization of their healthcare system. The treaty prevents us from that, and there will be a major, a major row if we were now pretending to do that or wishing to do that. But the fact that we don't tell countries what to do in terms of healthcare doesn't mean we shouldn't tell them how they're doing. Therefore, we in, and embark in a really, really you know, thorough exercise of knowledge brokering in the field of healthcare because it is extraordinary how much health has a weight in the uh, expenditure of member states, how much has a weight and an implant inf influence on people's well-being, and how little we know about healthcare, particularly about outcomes in healthcare. So we decided to do a real strong effort, and of course not to do it alone. We had a reorganization of my DG. My, I changed my DG to make sure that there was a far stronger focus on country knowledge. But then we entered into a partnership with the OECD and the EU Observatory for Healthcare. Particularly the OECD, I mean, I have a very long-standing experience with Andrea Schleicher in education, with Stefano Scarpetta in employment. The OECD has a wealth of information. What they don't have is teeth. They don't have a way to make sure that the wealth of information they have has a real impact with some kind of conditionality with member states' performance. So we thought we would indeed partner with uh, these two institutions to produce the state of health in the EU cycle. Now, this is what? It is a, a two-year cycle where we produce uh, in, on even years, so starting in 2016, November last year, the traditional health of the glands Europe uh, of the OECD. M anybody here in this room who looks at healthcare knows this publication. Since last year, health of the glands Europe has taken the shape and the format of our policy development, our communication of 2014 on access, efficiency, and resilience of healthcare systems. So health of the glands Europe becomes one leg of a two-year cycle. And every odd year, starting on 23rd of November this year, just uh, 10 days ago, we have 28 country reports of the state of health in the EU and a companion report that gives you the synthesis from the Commission of what these reports say about common trends and future. And since we want to have not just a, an intellectual exercise, but also some input on policy, we are proposing to our member states a voluntary exchange. So on the basis of the key challenges we identify in the state of health reports, country reports, we propose with the OECD, the observatory, missions and exchange uh, for policy development and improvement uh, uh, on the basis of this report. So this is uh, 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 the product. Uh, 
Uh, what is the use of this product? Well, this is something we see as being mm -hmm. at the service of the Commission as a whole. By the way, it's another product done by, just by us. EG Ecfin contributed uh, very, very prominently. But we hope that this will be at the service. For example, when the EU, when the Commission tries to determine the priorities for spending for future structural funds, well, this is no, there's no direct connection between this and that. But I hope that there will be a far stronger case on the part of the Commission because of a far stronger knowledge of the reality and the challenges of member states, including in the field of healthcare, and that this knowledge will not be disputable because the data that are here are not just good data from good professionals, they are based on statistics that are accepted by member states across the board. So this is the, the sense of this. Same thing for the semester. Is there a link between this and the semester? The short answer is no, because we don't have that formal link, but hopefully the country teams that will look at the performance of member states and the implications of what members are doing for public expenditure, they will look also at the better evidence here. Right. Let me, let me uh, say a few words about now the, the uh, companion report. Uh, uh, this is the synthesis of uh, what we find in the country reports. Let me just say uh, just a few words about the, the main findings. But first, an illustration of the sort of things you may find out because of the state of health. This is uh, the, a distribution of the frequency of knee replacements across the EU. Now, I don't know whether it's because the, the steep hills of Austrian hillsides or whatever other reason, but you are five, four times, four times more likely to get a knee replacement in Austria than in Portugal. Now, is there an explanation for that? I'm sure there is. Is this a therapeutic explanation? Well, certainly not. Therefore, it's really an interesting topic, topic to, to, to study. And then if you go to the Spanish country report, you see not just where Spain is situated here as an average of the EU, more or less in the middle, but you see that within Spain, there is not a difference between one and four between regions, but between one and five. So you can find yourself that with something that requires the same medical solution, the replacement of your kneecap, the chances you have to get a kneecap replacement are extraordinarily different. And I hope that this will be an incentive to look at this more closely. So, but let me say now a bit more about the key policy conclusions that come out of the 28 country reports. The first is the importance of uh, focusing on disease prevention. Uh, it may look as an obvious thing to say, but it's certainly not the thing that is often done. And there is no simpler, more straightforward way of saying to countries what they should do more than a stronger focus on health promotion and prevention, as opposed to the remedies of healthcare. And one very good expression of this is the second conclusion, which is the way one should use primary care. I mean, you have in Europe uh, about one in four uh, people who enter into a hospital that wouldn't necessarily have to if they had a good primary care assistance. So a strengthening of primary care is not just better for patients, it's also extraordinarily important for more efficient uh, uh, um, healthcare performance. And the third is uh, the importance of integrated care. Now, this is Again, something that may sound uh, uh, intuitively obvious, but it's something that, again, doesn't happen very often because between primary care, secondary, tertiary care, there is usually very little connection. And here is one of the areas where technology, mHealth, uh, and, of course, also what you can do cross-country uh, is uh, of particular promise. Um, the fourth uh, finding is a, a pretty striking uh, emphasis on the health workforce. To give you just an example, four out of 10 Austrian general practitioners, so those who will be looking at those patients who may get the knee replaced, four out of 10 Austrian general practitioners will retire between now and 2025. This is a huge opportunity of generational renewal, for example, for the absorption of technology and the capacity of the workforce to accept new technologies. But it's also a huge challenge because there's no way in heaven then those 40% can be replaced just like that, not because of time, but also because the normal tradition incentive of a medical student is actually to go anywhere but as a general practitioner. You want to be a neurosurgeon, and if not a heart surgeon, 
or maybe something else, but certainly not a general practitioner. Whereas countries with a demographic aging challenge, where multimorbidity is the key factor that determines healthcare expenditure, well, what you need is precisely good general practitioners. This issue of the health workforce, I won't, won't spend too much time on it, but let me just stress how important this is, because uh, uh, if you look at what is being done now in terms of e-health, and we will produce early next year a communication together with my colleague in DigiConnect on healthcare, so on e-healthcare, so the health aspect of the digital single market, mm -hmm. the immediate emphasis is on technology. But the issue of e-health is about health, not e and while it's wonderful to talk about gadgets and your watch is telling you how many steps you make every year, the real challenge is to make sure how you explain to an oncologist or a dermatologist that now diagnostics are better done with an algorithm, and how you explain to a nurse that she will have to change fundamentally or he will have to change fundamentally the structure and the content of their work. Uh, <laughs> lastly, patient-centered data, and here, I'd like to, to, to just stop for a moment because uh, we know so much about inputs into healthcare, number of beds. We know so much about outputs in terms of, for example, the performance of an operation. Has a prostate operation been successful, meaning has, is the patient surviving? We know so much about that, but we know so little about the outcomes of healthcare. And there are so many differences. For example, one of those poor people who get the knee replacement compared to another may have both successful operations, but a completely different life experience as to what is the success in terms of quality of life of that operation. So to address this issue, to have a better understanding of the outcome of healthcare systems, and to make sure that what every single speech will tell you about healthcare, which is that what counts is the patient, to make sure that this becomes a reality, we have come up with something that I think has an extraordinary promise, which is Paris. Paris is... Uh, one of those acronyms that uh, we yeah, come up with. Lasts. Yeah, but this is not from us. This is from the OECD. It's called Patient Reported Information Survey. This is a simpler version of what usually in the technical world is called PREMS and PROMS, Patient Reported Experience Monitoring and Patient Reported Outcome Monitoring. What is this? It's a methodology to have a better idea of the patient's experience to, with the healthcare system. Now, the potential for this, since this is a comparable methodology, is that this is actually, I hope, the PISA for health. You know about PISA? PISA is limited, especially at the beginning. It measures only a number of things. But it has been an extraordinary wake-up call so that education systems try to look at what kind of education they are producing and how they are doing with respect to themselves, historically, and with respect to others. We really hope that Paris will be the same for healthcare. And I really have a lot of faith in the promise of this. The first survey of Paris, I hope, will come out next year, uh, done by the OECD, I think with an extremely solid methodology and with extraordinary support, including financial support, by the Commission. This is, I think, a sense of what we're trying to do uh, in the Commission. We are extremely conscious that we have very little regulatory powers in healthcare. But we find it extraordinary how much this is taken as an excuse by member states not to be scrutinized, not to do an effort, and not to look at the harsh reality that the healthcare systems will be radically transformed and need to change. We hope that with this product, we are producing an incentive and a modest but I think substantial contribution to a better understanding of healthcare systems and their economic implications in Europe. There you go. Well, thank you so much, uh, Xavier. That was a very rich presentation, and I certainly uh, learned that that Paris is the next Pisa. So I think that's a, that's a nice nice headline to to remember. Paris is the next Pisa. So I think we will certainly very much uh, follow follow that work and and you know look at um, you know how much this, these kind of benchmark benchmarking exercises because I think f for the Pisa we certainly know that. Uh, as a benchmarking exercise, it has it had a huge impact on the political debates, right? And then led to quite a bit of change. And um, I think you uh, you were very critical of um, uh, the resistance on the number of, uh, by a number of member states to submit themselves to uh, some form of a 
you know, external tough monitoring for best practices and for improving the efficiency of the healthcare system. And of course, in times where um, public resources are limited, um, increasing the efficiency of public service provisioning is, is a very, very important aspect. So, 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 so just, to, yeah. just to say how, how uh, jealous I am sometimes of some of my colleagues, because I find myself discussing with the Director Generals for Health in Council, yeah. saying, well, uh, whatever topic, and then I get this protest from a few member states saying it's a scandal that the Commission is now producing or wanting to have a survey of the performance of healthcare systems with member states. And my response <coughs> is, well, dear sirs or ladies, I hope that your colleague in the EPC, in the Economic Policy Commission, Committee, will say the same thing, because the Economic Policy Committee has no trouble, no trouble at all having a macroeconomic study or committing, commenting to a survey on the fiscal aspects of healthcare. So we have the same member states from different perspectives taking extremely different views. And the case I try to make that, again, as we see in the country-specific recommendations, healthcare is already on the menu, actually in a much more comprehensive way than before, I think hopefully thanks also to the contribution we've had. It, the, the way the Commission and the, the semester looks at healthcare now is far more comprehensive than it was before. Right. But at the same time, you have now the healthcare stakeholders that say, no, I'm not playing this game. It is really striking, and I hope that we will together be able to have a much more you know, uh, sophisticated way of looking at what Europe can do and what member states can do for themselves in the field of healthcare, including its macroeconomic aspects. You know? Right. Sorry. No, yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that was a very, very helpful and uh, additional information about how these debates actually go. So, so thank you. Um, you, you, have, you can stay still a little I, bit? I can, or? I, I can stay another oh, Okay, so just so, to, to hear the interesting things that Zoltan was going to say. Okay, Jolt, so please. Yeah. And uh, no more than 10, 10 15 minutes. Yeah? Yes, thank you. <coughs> so, I mean, first of all, I, I would like to congratulate Xavier. Um, and, you, and your colleagues and the institutions you, you cooperate with for doing this report and also the earlier year reports, which, which I think are really eye-catching, eye-opening. Eye uh, I see in a number of member states that the comparative data that you produce across countries are reported in the media, discussed, especially in weaker member states, they, they highlight how, how bad, bad they are. So I think it's extremely useful, and, and also for me, I mean, I'm more a macroeconomist and, and I don't pretend to be a healthcare expert. I find so many very interesting and useful information, uh, which I believe many other people share this view. So really, a great congratulations for, for you to, to do that. Now, in our work that, that I, I, I do jointly with, with Nicolas Moss, uh, who is somewhere here, yeah, uh, Jana Miashenkova, who, who is there, and, and David Wichler who, from Austria, who is, who is there, so he may know about the knee replacement issue. Uh, we tried to assess the, the more the macroeconomic implications of, of healthcare. Um, the first table uh, is just remind us where we are in a, in a global comparison. So it shows just very basic information about the richness of the country as measured by GDP per capita, the healthcare expenditure and the two basic outcome indicators, child mortality and life expectancy. And we indeed see huge, huge differences across the world. Um, certainly Sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest region, spends only $200 in, even in purchasing power parity uh, a year on, on each person, which is, which is, if you compare to, they spend almost 9,000 in, in North America, but a huge difference, and it's also reflected very sadly in, in outcomes. It but public and private. yes, yes, it, it was. But it already already highlights the point that that one of the points uh, that, that Xavier has made, and that you also make many times in our paper, that money matters. So certainly, countries which spend more on health, they have better health outcome. But not everything. Just compare North America and, and Europe. In North America, especially the U.S., they spend almost three times as much on healthcare than, than we in Europe, yet also uh, child mortality is higher and the life expectancy at birth is lower in, in North America. So clearly, uh, money is not everything. So what we, what we try to do in this paper, so, so the key question we would like to answer is, is how healthcare systems and also health outcomes 
interact with the macro economy. And I already highlighted three most important aspects. Uh, Xavier, you also already discussed them. Uh, I will spend a bit more time on that. So one is the fiscal that, as you mentioned, healthcare accounts the, the largest public expenditure after pensions. Countries spend about 20 to 25 percent of their uh, public expenditures on, on healthcare. So it's a really a crucial item. Uh, <clears throat> so it has major, major certain implications for fiscal sustainability. And I refer to, to DG ECFIN, uh, who, where they did many, many excellent reports on, on the long-term sustainability of fiscal positions, including healthcare and other aging-related issues. The second is the, is the growth in labor market effects, impacts, which are, which would probably, which is in the, in the, in the focus of our, of our work. I mean, you already mentioned the, the premature deaths. I mean, how much, how much uh, lost GDP is, 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 is due to that. I mean, certainly very obviously, someone is sick at home, uh, he or she cannot work, or goes to the office uh, where not, not in a good health, then certainly productivity is, is, is much lower. It also has major implications for human capital development, as we will describe. And the third point, inequality, again, this is also mentioned by you, uh, that uh, it can also be a major factor. Health inequality can translate into income inequality, and in turn, both can translate into, into, into growth. So basically, these are the three aspects we, we cover in, in the paper. And there are two related questions. One is how to determine the public health care budget. Again, I showed you that, I mean, in, in Europe and in North America, basically the health care, I mean, at least per capita terms, they spend almost three times as much as, 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 as in Europe. You also showed, for example, the example of, of Cyprus and Luxembourg, that they spend almost, uh, almost the same, uh, <clears throat> yet uh, in uh, uh, amenable mortality, they have, they have almost identical uh, indicators. So how to determine public health care budget is a very crucial issue and not that straightforward, but what we discussed that issue. And, uh, and the other one is how to measure the efficiency of health care system. Certainly, it's, it's, there are certain more microeconomic ways to measure the efficiency of certain drugs or certain treatment and so on. But when we go to the macroeconomy, uh, many, many problems will, will uh, emerge as I will briefly discuss and perhaps spare, discuss uh, uh, in his, his remarks. So overall, the, the key question that we are, we are trying to address is, is what are the economic values in investing in healthcare? So just on the, on the public finance aspect, I just show two charts because, because I think that part is relatively well understood. Uh, as you mentioned, you, you talk a lot to finance ministries, and certainly these are, I think, the, the, the aspects they, are, they directly deal with. Now, this chart shows uh, just the level of, of public healthcare spending as a share of GDP and, and the expected change in the OECD baseline scenario. And again, as, as, as we all know, it's relatively high already and expect to expand further. So <clears throat> in a number of countries, they will have to spend one or two percentage more on their GDP. Uh, under the baseline scenario, which is really, really significant. Another issue which you also <coughs> uh, uh, related somewhat to, to, to what you discussed in the report is the resilience of, of healthcare spending, and um, which could be, for example, formulated in a, in a simple indicator of looking at uh, how stable healthcare spending to economic shocks. And <coughs> certainly we have data for all EU countries, but we decided just to show for uh, the group of this Northwest EU countries, uh, the older EU countries except Southern Europe, um, where you can see that even there was a major fall in economic activity in 2009, uh, they were able to keep healthcare spending even increase a little bit that year. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, in, in Northern Europe, there doesn't seem to be a major adverse impact of from economy to, to healthcare, but in Greece and Portugal, but we could also look at Italy, Spain, uh, the Baltic states, and a num number of other countries which were hard hit, uh, their healthcare spending really, really contracted a lot, uh, and which is even more unfortunate that many of these countries have much weaker uh, health indicators. So uh, <clears throat> it's really, uh, I mean, Devastating, in my view, if I can use such a strong word, <laughs> that um, that public health expenditure were cut by by you know 10% in in many consecutive years in these countries. But let me come <clears throat> to the to the next issue, on uh, <clears throat> on what is the optimal spending on on healthcare, and 
here I have two slides, one, one in which I, I show you the objectives and the second one on, on, the, on, the, on the key factors. So certainly a kind of optimal level would be which, which achieves the ob objectives, but certainly there are many, many objectives and, and limited resources, so there are, there are a number of trade-offs. So, so you always have to look at the opportunity cost, for example, why investing in healthcare, or investing in education, or investing in, in the environment. I mean, there's all, all many, many important, important issues. So, so if you, when we look at the literature, they typically find three ultimate objectives and a number of other objectives which could help to reach these objectives. So one is very obvious, I mean, improving health, that should be, uh, so all, all health, healthcare systems should be effective. The second one is meeting the community preferences again on, on, on what to spend and how much and so on. And, and the third is a fair contribution and accessibility, um, uh, which also comes to inequality issues. So for poor people, it's really essential to access good quality healthcare. And a number of, I would say, sub-objectives, which, which all related to reaching the, the main objectives, like resilience, timeliness, and efficiency. Uh, but let me come to the next slide which highlights some aspects which, which certainly, certainly should, be, should be considered. So I already mentioned the, 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 the preferences of the, of the population should be very clearly incorporated. Again, whether to spend more in education is also crucial, especially for disadvantaged families. Uh, income, <coughs> typically higher income people tend to spend more and prefer to spend more. And very importantly, what is the, the age and health structure of, of the population? But there are also a number of aspects related to the healthcare system itself. Uh, for example, what is the relative price uh, between uh, health-related activities and, and other, and in that the government has a role? Um, another important aspect um, uh, is, is a number, there could be a number of market failures in, uh, in the healthcare system because there's a magic asymmetric information between providers and, 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 and patients. Um, I mean, <clears throat> again, we can go to the knee replacement issue, you know, whether it's needed or, or whether, you know, uh, other treatment could, could reach the same result uh, at a much lower price uh, that a patient hardly knows. So the major, major asymmetric information problem which, in which the government has a strong role. And in the insurance market, there is another major problem, adverse selection. <clears throat> um, whereby certainly uh, <coughs> healthy people don't really want to sign up for uh, health insurance uh, and uh, insurance companies don't really want to offer health insurance to, to old and, and sick people. Uh, again, this also, these market failures also suggest that, that um, I mean, <coughs> the government has a, has a strong role. And certainly how effective uh, the health care is, 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 is also important. But what our paper is in the, would, like to, would like to emphasize is that, is that beyond all of these health-specific issues, there are major macroeconomic implications, uh, which also should be included when deciding about what should be the optimal budget on health. Now, <clears throat> let me come to efficiency. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there are a number of more microeconomic uh, methods to, to assess. But on the more macro side, um, we really struggled, uh, both with the literature. I mean, we, we surveyed a very, very large literature from Commission, OECD, has uh, uh, professors, and and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and I find find a nice we find a nice nice quote from the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, <coughs> uh, which says that that basically there's a major reason that that uh, there are major data differences, inconsistencies lack of consensus on the method. There are many, many methods. We review these methods in the paper, but I didn't want to burden my, my presentation with that. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the major difficulties in attributing health outcomes to health, healthcare inputs. For example, in, in the last point, we just mentioned a few. For example, geography, genetics, and, and, and lifestyle could also have major impact on, on, on health outcomes. Um, so, so in the, the more macroeconomic efficiency measurement, there are major problems. So, but at the end, we did is we just used the work that Per and his colleagues did at the at the at the commission, which is for one particular year. Uh, <clears throat> again, I don't want to go much into the technical details, but clearly it shows that there are major differences across countries. I mean, France, Netherlands, and Cyprus are are on the on the left side with, with more efficient health systems, while <coughs> Slovakia, Lithuania, Czech Republic, and Hungary, Latvia are more, more on the right-hand side. So clearly there are, there are major, major differences in efficiency. But given that, uh, I mean, this analysis was done for a particular year, uh, 
Again, the OECD had some earlier estimates, but it, it was very, very troublesome to, to find long time series or even time series um, on efficiency score. Our initial ambition to, to, to look at how efficiency and changes in efficiency is related to healthcare systems, unfortunately that was not possible. What was possible, in which I will show in a few, few charts, is to look at uh, some indicators of outcome related to total input. And again, this chart very much echoes Xavier's chart, which showed that, that money matters, but money is not everything. So in the horizontal scale, you can see for both panels, uh, the current expenditure on health uh, per capita uh, purchasing power <coughs> parity. And on the vertical scale on the left panel, you can see life expectancy at birth. And on the right scale, you can see uh, a standardized mortality rate, which adjusts mortality with the composition of the population. And for both, you can see a very similar thing that Savi Savier just showed, is that spending, let's say, if you increase spending from, from 1,000 to 4,000, uh, there is major improvement both in life expectancy and, and mortality. But beyond that, I mean, it depends on what kind of line, how flexible line you want, want to fit to, to the data points. But beyond that, is, 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 it's more or less flat. So clearly, money matters, but, but money is, is not everything. And there are many, many other aspects uh, which also determines the, the outcome. And also, it's also, also questions yet, you know, if you look at, let's say, Luxembourg and uh, Norway, we spend so much um, <coughs> um, whether they are spending that money efficiently. The next chart, um, so the previous one showed the levels. So we also looked at the changes, because it could be that, you know, some countries have certain positions, and, and for the levels, you, you especially for, for, for higher spending, you don't really see big impacts, but, but for the changes, you might see. And indeed, you might see some relationship. But if you look at closely, unfortunately, the, the, <clears throat> the sentence in the bottom is not, not fully, fully readable, that the countries which you know, improved the most. They, they, uh, so they, they spent little in the past and had the worst position. So, uh, you know, if you are quite beyond, let's say, the efficiency front, frontier and, and, and spend little, then, you know, some spending will help you a lot to, to achieve much better outcomes. But again, if you look at the, the large data points, let's say around, around 100, 150% on, on, on both scales, again, it's difficult to see that, that you know, I mean, there is a major, major difference across the, across the countries. <clears throat> the next, next major issue relates to, relates to, the, to, the, to the labor market. Um, and I, unfortunately, I have to speed up because my 15 minutes is, is, has, has just passed. But let me show a few things and then come to, come to, the, to the concluding slide. Uh, that certainly there's a major direct link between health and, and economic activity. Uh, I mean, just we can think about the foregone, foregone output. Uh, now in the EU, <coughs> currently, f more than 4% of the working age population is inactive due to, due to ill health. Uh, now, probably not all of these people could be uh, involved in the, in, the, in the labor force, even with better health policies, but perhaps some of them could be, and that could be a major boost to, um, to, the, to the labor market. There's also another aspect that uh, if we improve health, it will also have a kind of longer term cost because if people live certainly longer, then certainly long term care uh, <coughs> would, 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 uh, would certainly increase. And let me show you one more chart which is discussed in the, in the, in the, uh, in the next, next slide, which shows practically no relationship, <coughs> again, between public health care spending and the inability to work due to illness or, or disability. And what is, what is was very striking, if you look at the top right, so the, let's say Denmark and, and Norway, and also the Netherlands, they, they, they spent almost the most, um, uh, and they have almost the higher rates of, of inactivity. So it also means that other aspects of public finances, for example, the generosity of the welfare state, might also play a role, because, <clears throat> uh, and also Belgium uh, is also quite, quite, try, quite high on the, on, on the, on, on the top right. Uh, <clears throat> so, so even if we spend more on health, but at the same time we have, we have such a welfare state which, which encourages people not to go back to work, then they, you know, they may, might find ways to, to report uh, illness or disability and stay away from work. Now, and the last issue is, is maybe uh, inequality. <coughs> um, uh, I have a chart, but I, I skip. <coughs> just let me 
just just mentioned that that uh, again this very much echoes what what Savier has said. <clears throat> um, I mean the first point says that in fact healthcare system could be a very efficient way or a very useful way to reduce inequalities because if everyone would have the same good access to good quality healthcare, it could somehow you know um, alleviate the problem which come different incomes. But in the in the chart that I just rushed through, it shows that in a number of countries there are very different access for the poor and the rich. Uh, many more poor people report that they have unmet um, health needs, uh, and certainly that's 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 a major major concern. Savi also mentioned we also had a report with Guntram last year in which showed that that poor and less educated people have much less healthy lives and much shorter lives. Again, uh, <clears throat> which is which is a very uh, devastating uh, result. So clearly inequality has a, has a major impact and inequality could, could uh, have a feedback on growth. But since my time is out, let me just come to, to three major messages that we would, we would like, to, like to deliver. <clears throat> the first one is that both, the, both healthcare systems and healthcare outcomes have major macroeconomic implications through three channels. Fiscal aspect, which I think is very well understood. Labor market and inequality, which I believe is much less understood, so we would like to very much emphasize that these aspects should also be included in all discussions of health. The second is that efficiency measurement, especially at the macroeconomic level, has, has major you know, problematic elements, but we find a very large heterogeneity. Um, so it's not true that all countries uh, spend their healthcare money in the most efficient way. So certainly learning from best practices is, is, um, is, is a key, key lesson. And the third on the health budget, so if the health budget, let's say, only focuses on, on fiscal uh, uh, sustainability in a, in, a, in a more narrow sense, but a more broader impact of healthcare on, on the potential increased revenues due to higher activities, higher productivity, and decreased ex expenditures uh, uh, due to uh, fewer ill people are neglected, then the outcome uh, could be, I mean, the, the budget outcome allocating resources could be suboptimal. So these are the three key messages. and. Let me thank you for attention and stop here. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank you, Jolt. That was, I think, a very, very good overview and also showing, showing the difficulty with um, you know, some of the macro measurements. Um, I think that that was quite striking. The other pe aspect that I think certainly deserves a lot of attention is the inequality effects of... Uh, of healthcare and you know inadequate healthcare provisioning, and then the subsequent, of course, macroeconomic implications um, of that, where you can quite clearly see if poor people don't have access to healthcare and therefore don't even have the ability to enter the labour market. I mean, that's not just uh, an inequality problem that needs to be addressed; it's also a macroeconomic efficiency problem. And I think, I think your presentation shows that quite quite nicely. And so, so I think you know. That's perhaps a, a, an interesting part for, for our discussion now. Now, let me move to, uh, to our discussions, and uh, let's start with uh, Caroline uh, Kostongs. And uh, perhaps you can also say two, three words about um, EuroHealthNet before, before you start with your uh, comments and your co uh, contribution. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so EuroHealthNet uh, indeed is a European partnership for improving health equity and well-being. And it consists uh, of mainly national public health institutes and also regional health authorities in all EU member states. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm uh, delighted to, to be here and also uh, great to see that the Bruegel Institute is also now moving into the health policy field. So very good. Um, and I would also like to congratulate the Commission with uh, the report, which is very interesting, and particularly the country profiles will be very useful for us uh, in our work with the Member States. And uh, the companion report uh, has some uh, important uh, overall recommendations, which are very, very good. Uh, however, we have also known these issues for quite some time, and we also know that it is quite difficult to change, let's say, the vested interests in healthcare systems. Um, so uh, it's still a lot of work then to, to be done. So I would like to make three points related to this debate. One is on prevention, one on inequalities, and one on uh, EU action or EU, EU added value. 
Of course, the fundamental principle is what you already set out, that good health benefits uh, the whole of society. I mean, healthy people, healthy employees, they contribute to economic prosperity. But also a second thing which is, I think, important not to forget is that health care systems, I mean, they are large em employers. And also with, their, um, uh, with all the supporters and with the supply chains they have, they have very strong benefits for social and economic developments at the community level. I think it's important to highlight. Okay, for the first uh, point now is that for, for a long time we argue for a shift uh, in investments from health care and cure to more health promotion and disease prevention. We have to avoid that people get sick in the first place and end up in hospitals. I think after all, uh, a prevented illness is the cheapest option for us all. Uh, which is, I think, very clear, but it means that we need to transform our systems to more preventative systems. And it does not only mean more vaccination and more screening, it also doesn't mean uh, we have to pay attention to alcohol, uh, diet, physical activity, uh, and nutrition, but also it means that uh, we try to incorporate other sectors in the debate and that we try to to address the underlying causes of illness and, and disease. And this should be done at global, European, national and uh, local levels. We are clearly facing an older society, so this means that our systems need to incorporate support systems for older people so that they can also look after their own health. This means that we need to invest in community-based local services that include health services, but also social services, perhaps even employment services, uh, connected through digital platforms, including sport clubs, uh, gardening, uh, various activities on the ground, connecting people, volunteers, professionals, so that uh, we can work towards prevention of diseases, people can change their lifestyles and healthy behaviors and, um, um, and, and be, be together. So I, I strongly believe that the future of health business is the prevention business and also personalized health promotion and then networked in communities. And then together, obviously, which was the second point of the report, with strengthened primary care uh, uh, centers and services um, to as important gatekeepers for, for the health systems. And I think that can lead to more financially sustainable health systems. Okay, move now to my second point, which is that we need to take uh, particular attention to the health inequalities that exist in Europe, which was already um, in, mentioned in your presentation, Zolt. I think it's it, it should be clear to you that health inequalities are not biologically determined. Eh? It is uh, through our uh, policy actions and the way how we shape our societies that they are there, and they are also increasing. So health inequalities means that there are systematic relationships between the health of people and the socio-economic conditions in which they live and work. So every time you go one step down the socio-economic ladder, your health gets worse and you have more health problems. As much as 40% uh, of people at the bottom of the socio-economic gradient, they haven't really benefited from socio-economic growth. They often um, uh, locked in their day-to-day -day situations in disadvantaged communities where there is more, let's say, air pollution, less gr uh, green spaces, uh, uh, bad quality housing, cramped schools, less playgrounds. Um, you know, people have less coping resources also and less choices to move out and move, move on. So health systems need to be much more sensitive to the diverse needs that people have, to the socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds, and, and respond uh, to, to their issues. So we need to be much more vigilant that we maintain this equal access to health services, but also that we get equal outcomes, health outcomes, which was um, stressed before. For example, the transformations that we need and that we will happen in health systems will uh, see more an increased um, freedom of choice, uh, which puts more individual, individual responsibility uh, for health. But this also means that not everyone can, has the capacity or the capability to make such choice. Already now we see that people choose for unhealthy products or they are not making optimal use of, of health systems. 
Uh, we also know that not everyone has the same opportunities to choose. The same for the digital health agenda. No new technologies will not necessarily uh, reach uh, everyone, and innovation can exacerbate inequalities. Those people that are older, uh, poorer, or more digital literate will uh, uh, be left, by out, uh, left out and left behind. Um, as the state of health uh, in reports, uh, the, the, the report states that the health inequalities is one of the public health challenges um, uh, in the EU. It is a signal that current health systems are not uh, sufficiently able to, to deliver effectively. But I would also say it's also a signal that other global, national or local policies are contraproductive and undermining health rather than, than promoting health. So, but I have to finish. I have wanted to talk about this, my third point around uh, EU action and the EU added value. Um, I will just briefly say that we have to realize that good health is not the outcome of one sector, is not the outcome of health systems, but from a comprehensive, a coherent approach. Just as an example, in the UK, you see that life expectancy is no longer increasing, it's plateauing, and that's not because of their health systems, because they are generally good and well set up, it's because of austerity measures, and that, that is a sign that we have to work uh, in a way which is more political, I, I think. We have to really uh, be there and make uh, and see what the health considerations are of various other um, uh, policies. I had some examples for that. I just wanted to highlight the European semester as an important macroeconomic tool, which is also flagged by Xavier, that has put some country-specific recommendations around the need to invest in primary care, in prevention, in promotion, and it is being taken up by some countries, which is, uh, which is really good. So if there is like strong will willingness at the EU level and also at the member state level, uh, to go for this and also to implement, like the European pillar of uh, social rights, which are setting 20 principles, of which one is on access to good quality care. If member states are implementing that, then I think we are moving ahead in the right uh, um, direction. Then in conclusion, um, we are, there are some interesting times, <laughs> that's for sure, in terms of the transformation of health systems to preventative systems, tackling inequalities, and also EU action for health. Um, I think that the EU and member states, they can become leaders in the transformation of health systems, uh, and they can do really well, and they can, if they make sure that they are truly health-promoting uh, health systems. Um, I started off by saying that health is good for the economy, but I think it's also very much the other way around. It is that the economy should also serve the health and well-being of, of people. I don't think it is technology that is limiting. It is probably the economy and economic models that need some work uh, to see um, how we can move <coughs> in, better, in better directions. And Eurohealthnet is very interested to, uh, to play a role in this and to support uh, where possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline, for this very rich presentation and also three very clear points. Uh, let me now move to, to Pea. Uh, Pea Eckfeld is um, at DG Eckfeld. Thank you again, Kremen. Thanks for the kind invitation to this very interesting uh, conference. Um, I'll um, focus my brief uh, less than 10 minutes, I suppose, uh, intervention on uh, firstly, on the economic and fiscal impact of uh, uh, healthcare policies, which is where the bulk of our work has been uh, carried out. Uh, then um, I'll mention uh, the incorporation of healthcare related issues into the European semester over the last few years. It has uh, entered the coordination exercise much more. Uh, since uh, essentially the launch of Europe 2020 strategy than was the case previously. Um, I'll recall some of the key challenges that health systems are facing that we found in our cooperation with the member countries and conclude with what's next. Okay, so firstly on the economic and fiscal impact, uh, uh, we have a, a deep interest in what all of the previous speakers have uh, focused on, which is the fiscal aspect of healthcare. This is simply because of uh, uh, the uh, powers currently um, accorded to the EU level 
through the uh, fiscal framework and in particular the setup of MU. So we are tasked with assessing budgetary positions over the short term standard budget preparation, but also over the medium term and the long term and provide potential risks to securing fiscal sustainability. This is one of the channels through which healthcare enter our work uh, through both primary and secondary legislation at the EU level. Uh, so clearly healthcare is very important. We heard the other colleagues here already mentioning uh, healthcare absorbs a lot of public resources already today and is likely to uh, increase uh, much further into the future. For example, on the average in the EU, health uh, care related expenditure was about 6% of GDP in 1990. It had risen to about 9% of GDP in 2015. And it could, in a prudent baseline projection, rise to about 13% of GDP in 35 years' time. But it could also be uh, as high uh, as four to five percentage points higher of GDP. So even in a baseline scenario, uh, it would be absorbing a larger proportion of economic resources even than pensions in uh, 20, 30 years. So this is something that very carefully needs to be monitored, uh, of course. Um, so th this is the fiscal impact. This is the aggregate picture across the EU. Uh, EU is not one country. EU is 28 countries or 27 countries, depending on when you uh, time your comment. Uh, there's huge variety uh, uh, among uh, healthcare expenditure, both in terms of current public resources going into the systems and in terms of the prospects for future spending pressures, depending on demographic factors and depending on country-specific institutional factors. This needs to be factored in, uh, in into analysis into, uh, in, in a comprehensive way. Um, what we have done uh, so far since the launch of the Europe 2020 strategy five years ago, six years ago, uh, is that we have put some emphasis on the fiscal aspects of healthcare. And uh, in the latest round of the European semester, there were 10 recommendations in the area of healthcare, um, not only on fiscal sustainability, but also on other aspects of healthcare, because uh, we are. Uh, uh, rebalancing uh, the policy messages. In order to support this process and in order to identify which countries face the gravest challenges and what are the remedies for those challenges, we in the Commission in uh, ECFIN, we, we're preparing a horizontal assessment framework that is available uh, as a discussion paper that you can look at if you want. But we look at a lot of different dimensions of healthcare expenditure and where there are efficiency gains that could be reaped. So this is something that we're doing on an annual basis together with all of the colleagues in the Commission in order to arrive at a comprehensive view on what are the key challenges that countries need to focus on over the coming year. Um, so this is uh, already going into the uh, European semester uh, um, coordination exercise. Um, what we did last year was to prepare um, a report together with the member countries, uh, together incidentally with the Economic Policy Committee that Xavier mentioned previously. Uh, on, we, we tried to be very granular and we tried to really capture what are the reform challenges, what are the key challenges that member states at the moment see. So we started out as usual, we write a report, do a literature survey, look at what are the challenges. We try to do the analysis that SALT is now uh, also doing on efficiency analysis uh, macro approach. This is valid and this is valuable and very interesting. We wanted to supplement it, so we carried out a survey uh, together with our interlocutors, which is finance ministries. They in turn liaise nationally with the health ministries and we set up a questionnaire asking them, what are the main challenges in your country, in your ministry at this point, and also thinking ahead. We gathered all of this information, and we put all of this together in the report that we published last year, which is called a joint report on healthcare and long-term care systems and fiscal sustainability. So it identifies a series of key challenges 
based in part on classic academic approach on serving the literature and in part on actual on the ground survey information that we gathered. All of this were collected in a report uh, much similar to the uh, recent excellent report Santé colleagues in the Commission have published, consisting of a main report, main trends, and a volume two, which incorporates country profiles. So what are the challenges, what are the prospects, and what are the reform options? Um, all of this is then uh, used uh, across the various dimensions of healthcare in the European uh, um, semester coordination exercise. Um, the key policy challenges that we uh, found is clearly visible in the um, volume one report. There are essentially seven dimensions here. One is to, uh, kind of obvious, contain cost on hospital and pharmaceutical care. Uh, another key problem that emerged from the survey is that decision making is made in ministerial silos. So there is insufficient contact between line ministries uh, uh, in, in national coordination. Another message we heard already from the previous uh, uh, exposés is investing in primary care, in health promotion, and in disease prevention. And as Xavier mentioned, also in the context of the state of health, this can't be stressed enough. Other problems that uh, are faced at the ground is frequent budget overruns and competing fiscal pressures and chasing policy priorities. So this is normal. Countries need to prioritize every year when they set up a budget. And this process is overseen always by the finance ministry. But again, uh, what is um, the, the view is that the, uh, a truly holistic approach is necessary to this to identify the health cost dimensions, the labor market and economic dimensions. Uh, finally, improving the quality of information is always there. It also has perhaps inequality aspects. What actually is available for me? What can I get in my little part of this country? And finally, fraud and corruption is also present in this uh, context. Let me wrap up in uh, less than a minute, obviously. Um, so we, what we have seen is then that uh, uh, fiscal sustainability related challenges for health systems relatively well covered already in the European semester coordination exercise and with the challenges identified and the recommendations made, uh, they're underpinned by horizontally consistent analysis. This is why member states have accepted these recommendations. If they are not well underpinned, countries are wary about accepting those. Indeed, they were accepted because the Council did adopt the recommendations. Other challenges for healthcare are increasingly being incorporated, and the State of Health Initiative will certainly uh, uh, give more impetus to this, uh, uh, this process of um, taking a more broad, uh, comprehensive approach. Um, what is important, as I mentioned, is that we need to have consistent and coherent identification of the key challenges, and this we need to do in cooperation with the member countries because in the end, in order to achieve effective implementation of recommendations, countries need to feel that this challenge concerns them. This is something that they want to solve for their own countries. So uh, by having a, a common diagnosis, we're you're able to get in better implementation at the member state level, which up until today is the key level for designing social security and health systems. Uh, in terms of next steps, we will make updates of all of our fishes during the spring in taking a stock of the new uh, reforms that countries have undertaken in the last year and re-identify the key challenges based on reform progress. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pea, for, for also giving the DG ECFIN perspective, which of course is very much a perspective looking at the sustainability of uh, public finance, um, and perhaps putting less emphasis on, um, let's say, the, the productivity side of, of the health spending, um, which we heard already from quite a bit from from DG Santé. But we have uh, also uh, Sylvain Giraud, um, 
sitting here on the panel. Now, I don't know if you want to quickly complement uh, what the Director General has already said or whether you want to reserve your ammunition for the Q&A. I mean, uh, perhaps just a few, few short remarks, uh, and then we will turn to, to Petra. Yeah, I'm happy to do as you wish, but uh, if no, I have the floor. So <laughs> now, I, what, I, what I'm going to say is that I, I of course, agree 100 percent with what Per said and what he described. Much more than what I, I, I would like to say. Also, picking up on what you were saying just after Per, it's not so much the DG ECFIN perspective that I think he presented. It's very much the way we work together inside the Commission, and which is reflected in the document he mentioned and also in the reports that uh, Xavier uh, published. I think the um, of course, different DGs are responsible for different uh, objectives, but I think we've managed uh, years after years in the Commission to uh, come up with a very uh, uh, consistent narrative around health systems, which looks at uh, the, the, the different dimensions, which in our own uh, jargon and language we've uh, uh, grouped around the concept of uh, access effectiveness and um, resilience and in a way that encapsulates the different elements that we, we look at in our analysis and I think it would be unfair to say that uh, the finance ministers are only looking at the fiscal sustainability not taking care of the actual uh, uh, macroeconomic importance of health uh, or that uh, in our case uh, or maybe Caroline's case, uh, we're only looking at the inequalities aspect and, the, uh, and taking no care about cost and cost efficiency, um, or effectiveness, cost effectiveness. Um, on, on this, uh, Xavier said also at the beginning that uh, what's challenging is what's the EU added value? What can the EU do and what can the Commission do? Well, we have um, traditionally at EU level uh, two or three or four different uh, instruments. So there is macroeconomic coordination, and Per mentioned that, and we discussed that the semester. We are, of course, very much involved in that, uh, DG Santé, in, in the coordination inside the Commission. There is also legislation, very limited in this area, but still relevant to the single market and to the functioning uh, and to the organization of free movement, being the free movement of product, being the free movement of. Uh, of uh, people, that of course has also macroeconomic uh, 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 effect. Um, on, um, there is also all sorts of cooperation that we can develop between member states. It's not because uh, health systems are primarily a national competence, and that of course health should be del or healthcare should be delivered. Uh, closer to the people, subsidiarity principle, all this is obvious, but as, as has been said already many times today, health systems face similar challenges across Europe. So talking about your respective challenges together and maybe finding a certain number of, if not common solutions, but similar solutions that could be developed in parallel sounds quite obvious and probably is very much what the European Union is about. Uh, but in this area, it seems that we often have to make the case for that type of cooperation. We are uh, with the uh, in DigiSante, with uh, our um, uh, health program uh, supporting uh, this kind of cooperation. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, one is uh, HTA, developing HTA as a cost effectiveness mechanism to, uh, this is a, one of the tools that is very strongly recommended to ensure that um, uh, new technologies in particular, but also new treatments new, uh, that uh, are put on the market that are good supported uh, through the system uh, are cost effective, are actually not only delivering effective, but also compared to existing other uh, interventions, they are actually adding value. So we're promoting HTA uh, so that member states can use common tools and develop common approaches to health technology assessment. We are um, uh, supporting the member states' uh, work on uh, health systems performance assessment, which is how do you actually report and assess your own health systems. The objective here is not to develop a single EU framework for that, even if to a certain extent what we've done now with the 28 profiles goes into this direction, but what is to more to give the member states the possibility to discuss how they do it at national level. And we've been looking at different, so it's very much about measuring. And in fact, the good news or the challenging news is that this year, next year, 2018, we're going to look at how to measure efficiency. 
which, as you said, is quite challenging, and probably would be very interested to discuss with you and your team on your own work in relation to that. Last year, we looked at how do you measure the integration of care, also quite challenging, because first you need to know what it is, integration of mm -hmm. care, and very, very different people have very different views. We looked at primary care, what, how to measure um, uh, the primary care effectiveness. Uh, so we looked at different things like this every year. There is a report which I invite you to look at if you're interested. They're all available. And we support uh, all sorts of coordination and cooperation between member states also on prevention and promotion uh, activities, trying to highlight the best practices. Also on e-health, uh, we are uh, supporting activities. We also, uh, one of your questions, Zolt, was very interesting, which is what are, what, are the eco value, what, do, what are the economic values of investing in healthcare? It's also a question that we try to work on because, uh, because of the structural funds. How do we make sure that the EU in support um, to national investments uh, are, 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 is good value for money? And the same with the investment plan now, how to invest in health care in a way that this is actually um, supporting the objective of the, of the investment plan. So we're looking at these things with the IB, with other actors in that sector. Uh, so many of the questions that you asked are very relevant for our work. Uh, I stop there. Um, just maybe I should say uh, that all the documents that Xavier mentioned, so the 28 profiles in both English and the national languages, plus the companion report which is presented, which is a staff working document um, of the Commission, all this is available with a little video and some other uh, materials on the website of DigiSante, so I invite you to, um, to, to look at this. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, uh, Sylvain. So, so last but not least, uh, Petra, it's been a long, long list of speakers already, but uh, be, I think we very much look forward to, to hearing the perspective from, from the industry also. Thank you. Thanks, Guntram. And uh, being last is not the worst because you can refer and comment on everything that, that has been said. So when, uh, when preparing for the event, I was actually thinking, what is the relation of our industry to health and the state of health in Europe? And there are a couple of aspects that I could have taken. One is, of course, if we have been looking at the increase in life expectancy, right, that has been seen. And if you look at increase in life expectancy in the developed world in the last decades, the majority of the increases is due to new medication. So the innovation this industry has bring board is a major factor in improving and lengthening life. So that's the, the first interface. The second actually is um, the macroeconomics, so the research investment in terms of competitiveness in the European Union. Our sector, the research-based industry, is in relative terms the um, number one and in absolute terms the number two of investment in research in Europe and this brings a lot of competitiveness, economic growth. Um, so the, the relevance of the healthcare sector, you know, not only for health but also for economic growth cannot be um, stressed enough. But actually the topic of today is healthcare systems and so why are we as an industry actually interested in solid um, healthcare systems. This is because we have a lot to offer. We produce new medicines. We have full pipelines. Um, there was a little bit of a low in 2000. This industry came up with only new new medicines. In 2015, this industry came up with 60 new medicines. And when we think about medicines, it's not only that we use the science to, to produce medication that addresses unmet medical need, but we also think about how can these products be used. And for this, we have a huge interest in competent partners, the healthcare system, that should be able not only to pay for the new medication, but also to leverage the benefits to its best by having integrated care pathways, knowledgeable primary care who know when to transfer and, and where to best use the medicines. So that, that is vital in achieving the mission of this industry in inventing new medicines and making them available. Looking at what is a good healthcare system, so I concur with something that has been said before. I, I support all the recommendations um, of the companion report we have seen, and none of them is really new. So we probably need to um, 
move our thinking, how can we make it happen, investing in prevention, investing in primary care, and also driving more the database out um, uh, for understanding we talked about efficiency of healthcare interventions, right? What, what can we really do? And we believe the underlying tool to move the story forward is actually to base our decisions even more on the health outcomes and the data we collect that we achieve with our interventions. And an outcomes-based healthcare system has three opportunities. The first is it avoids waste, so it leads to affordability and efficiency of the system because you really are able over time to limit the interventions you offer to those that work. The second is it improves quality because um, patient reported outcomes are more and more important and what the patient really needs is in the center. So it allows to target um, the care to the needs of the people and it helps addressing the inequalities we have been talking about. And the third real opportunity about data driven healthcare systems, which is of course also in line with our needs, is that it rewards innovation and it helps us steer our research agenda to what is needed most. So we have an alignment of incentives um, that helps us get um, unity. And you talked about the health technology assessment work of the European Commission, for example. We support this a lot because we are faced with 27 member states who all have different expectations on how they want to measure what good looks like uh, and what to expect from our medicines and that's multiplying the requirements in terms of data. That's as ineffective as you can um, imagine. So last, um, what do we believe uh, Europe can do? So we highly welcome um, the European Commission being partner in this debate. Uh, we want to push you to even more to open the learning space from country to above country level. The concrete areas is um, based on what I've been saying, to keep pushing for investment in data infrastructure and for alignment on what good looks like in terms of which health outcomes are actually those we target. Um, there are a couple of IMI projects, so in the Horizon 2020 programs that look also at interoperability of data. So all of this work and maybe even the financing tools of the European um, Union can be used to push more investment in building up data infrastructure. That's number one. Number two is it would be great to see a sectoral approach to health data. You have been mentioning already there's a digital e-health report coming up. So if we look, for example, at the um, European Data Privacy Directive that's being implemented, um, that is a big risk for our research um, ambitions because many interpretations of the directive are left to member state level and we risk being faced with some very uneven um, space, but our research is global, so we need to be able to move data, we need to have aligned um, approaches to protecting privacy and have access to data and maybe the health sector is one where we can have a sectoral data policy because health data is A, particularly sensitive, but B, also particularly valuable for moving um, insights and also health systems forward. So that's number two. And uh, number three, it has been said before, whatever reform ideas you have to help break down the silos, the silos thinking in healthcare, that would be highly helpful because if we, if we talk about integrated care and leveraging efficiencies, how can we do this if even from DG ECFIN I hear a key problem is, you know, um, containing cost of hospital and medicines. I don't understand this. The key challenge actually is creating increasing efficiency and containing overall healthcare cost. but the sectoral approach is not going to help. And when I looked at the one slides, I was pleased to see that um, France was one of the most efficient um, systems mentioned here, which is a country which has of the highest uh, per capita consumption of medicines. So that's a one data point observation. I'm here in an economist think tank, so I would probably have fun to look more into this, but this was a little thing to look at. So the breaking down of the silos is, is for us one of the key levers in moving forward in improving healthcare. And I stop here and I'm looking forward to more debate.
All right. Uh, so we managed to actually stay in in the time that we scheduled um, on the agenda. Um, so we have time for uh, Q and A, but also, of course, for reactions here across the podium. So, so who would like from the audience to to ask a question? Yes, please, or make a comment. Also, we have a bit of time. So. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Giorgio Clarotti, working in, in DG Research. Um, I had the, the pleasure of having lunch with Amartya Sen some 10 years ago, and, and I was questioning about the poor healthcare systems in, uh, uh, in America, and, in, and he said something very insightful, at least, which is no American president would be elected with the employment levels you have in Europe no European leader would be elected with the poor health care we have in the United States. What I miss in the health care report from, uh, from the Union, but I got from uh, Mr. Dava's uh, report, is to put in perspective the opportunity that we have with the health care system in Europe. We have a health care system which is very competitive if we benchmark it uh, worldwide. We always benchmark our employment with the states. And the reason I quoted uh, Amartya Sen is that it appears from the multiple surveys and from the voting that healthcare in, in, in Europe is something performant. I, and I quote another example of the healthcare report. It is said in one of your visual uh, infographs that uh, prevention on uh, breast uh, scans. Uh, there is inequality because in the top quintile it is uh, only 5% of women who don't get it, while in the lowest quintile it is four times more, it is 25% of women in Europe who don't get a breast scan. I would really be surprised or interested to know what's the breast scan level in the United States or, or Asia, for example. So we are looking at something which, according to me, worldwide works rather well. We are insisting on the inequalities while the real focus and uh, the macroeconomic is how can we, we sustain that. Uh, and I have a question for you. Uh, with uh, artificial intelligence coming, with robots coming, with millions of jobs which are, which are going to disappear, I think that healthcare is something where humans will outperform robots for a long, long time. I mean, the Japanese are going for the 20 million robots in 2020 because they don't have the healthcare system or the possibility to have a healthcare system like we have. Yet most of these jobs are not paying. Millions of jobs in healthcare are not paying. So uh, I'm quoting Mariana Mazzucato there. We need to create markets. We need to make healthcare paying because these jobs are jobs that humans will do better than, than, than computers. And I think these are for the moment, I think, a, a challenge which is not in, in any of the reports. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I think many, many interesting points that you raise, but I certainly would like to push um, my panelists to, to talk a little bit more about this aspect of you know, how technology is transforming the entire working of the healthcare system and whether our systems are actually ready to uh, to move into AI and so on and so forth. And, you know, how we can also create, I think that's an interesting aspect, markets for, um, and whether it's actually the right approach um, to create markets for uh, some segments of the health uh, system that perhaps are currently not uh, subject subject to markets, but I, I like to hear also really this this AI aspect. I mean, of course, we know that already now. Uh, let's say Watson, uh, IBM, uh, artificial intelligence um, can uh, <coughs> detect um, things like breast cancer. <coughs> um, at least, uh, I mean, okay, I'm not I'm not an expert, but that's what I heard. So so, as as well as. Um, as uh, medical doctors, <coughs> so so to what extent are we ready to also adopt these kind of technologies, um, AI, in um, uh, prevention and detection of of diseases, and apply them? So so perhaps that's that's something we can debate here. I don't know if I look at you, perhaps Silva, to start. Well, it, it was new techno but new technologies they are also often very costly, at least in the first years where they are introduced. So I think, was, as I said before, the key concept here is cost effectiveness. And do we have the tools to assess the cost effectiveness 
in a way that uh, we make sure that the new technologies that are effective can uh, be used, but that they are used uh, in a way that uh, the sustainability of the system is not put at risk. And um, uh, some innovation are very effective, cost effective, and some are less cost effective. The other issue is access to um, innovative products, and I think you mentioned that earlier on. Um, there's a, a lot of different things that are put under the label e-health at the moment, and you know, it goes from the, the app that measures your steps, and that you can discuss the cost effectiveness of that, uh, to a very uh, elaborated, sophisticated uh, um, scanners or new, new machines, new uh, medical devices. So it's also important to, to discuss what we're talking about. Uh, HTA is a, an important tool in that context where, to measure um, the cost effectiveness. You know, we're talking about AMR, for example. They, I, I visited a, a, with the commissioner last year an hospital in... A, in, in the Netherlands, which has managed to, re, to, to, to diminish very much the level of uh, hospital-acquired infection and resistant to uh, antimicrobial uh, um, uh, infections that are resistant to uh, antibiotics. The way to do that in that hospital was not through a very efficient technologies, well, it depends what you call technologies, but they just made sure that everyone was washing their hands. And that, mm -hmm. that helped a lot. Also, they imposed on their staff to change clothes on a systematic basis and not to keep that nice scarf or that nice, um, that nice uh, shoes. Uh, but they, and that reduced in just a few months the number of hospital-acquired infection. So there are new technologies that are very important, but sometimes the old-fashioned technologies also help. Yes, I would like to add to that the need not to overestimate too much the importance of uh, technologies and also to be aware that about 43% uh, of all European citizens are not digital literate. So we really have to take uh, care that uh, this innovation reaches everyone and not only the ones that are well off or are um, educated and situated, they can use it. I just would like to uh, flag up something el else in this discussion and as a consequence of the technologies is that in particular young people now are using uh, a lot of technologies for to make it come for their work. You know, the peer-to-peer -peer economy, um, the, the digital platform economy, as it is called, so they use like Airbnb, the Uber, all sorts of, you know, and, <clears throat> and they make the money. But, um, you know, it doesn't come with appropriate social protection. It doesn't come with, uh, you know, <clears throat> appropriate health insurance. So what if things happen to them? They are not properly assured. They may not seek um, health care support because it's too... Um, uh, too costly. So we have to take into account that our society is changing in terms of jobs. Our jobs are changing due to technology and, uh, and what that impact uh, has on, on health. Maybe two quick aspects in the debate. One, artificial intelligence. So in our scenarios, we assume that doctor decisions will have massive support from decision-making systems in the future. So while still the physician will have the responsibility, the amount of tools to find the right treatment um, will, will grow. So that's the one element. The second about the cost effectiveness of new technologies and, and how do we deal with integrating innovation in the systems, right? So I would maybe be really bold and say, we cannot sell anything any longer nowadays that is not cost effective due to the assessments we have to undergo. And that's why we so much support the basis of data. If we can prove that our innovation brings value, then we are rightfully happy to sell it. And otherwise, there is simply no market for it. You know? So these times, these times are actually over, I would, I would state. Hi, my name's uh, Daniel Furby from FIPRA, um, the a consultancy. So uh, I just feel like sometimes we've been skirting around the real issue uh, when we're thinking about how to assess uh, health systems. And here I would recommend to everybody the Commission's work, particularly in the Health System Performance Assessment Expert Group, also what the OECD has been doing. Uh, for instance, their report earlier this year on waste, previously to that work they did on bridging 
finance and health system perspectives. You know, a lot of these issues have been gone into, just on a slight methodological point. I mean, life expectancy, putting that up against health spending is not really a, a robust method because most of what we're spending is going into care. You know, life expectancy is driven by a lot of things, as we were hearing, outside of the health care system. But most of what we're spending is going into health care, so we've got to be able to assess care. And this way, it sort of was missing in a lot of the discussion is about how do we assess quality of care? You know, I didn't really hear that very much. But that's really the question. And how, how do we assess quality of care? And there you need to break it down to different medical conditions. So there's, there's not one health system that's the best at quality of care. Some will be best in cancer. Some will be best in diabetes. And the, to pick up on Petra's point, this is where you need to get the data at that disease level. And I think that's the discussion we really need to be having, is about how do you assess quality of care? Uh, so maybe Sylvain would <laughs> like to comment. Uh, p perhaps I take, I think there was one quick question there. And is there any other question or comment? Um, oh, then, then behind, yes. And so, so please, you start. And please. Uh, yes, indeed, how to assess quality of care. But uh, assessing the quality of well-being, quality of life, will be more to the point, because it was in include care. Um, yes, uh, Petra, um, I couldn't agree more when you say that there is a need to break the silos uh, in uh, healthcare. I've trained as a physician specialized in neurosciences, and, but uh, I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult. Um, Caroline Costans, hello, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, you said uh, quite rightly, difficult to uh, change. Um, the vested interest in the healthcare system, I would add, it's very difficult to change uh, the vested interest in the educational system. Uh, there is a general recognition of the value of interdisciplinarity. The problem is it's assimilation. It's not that our brain can't. It's because of uh, an obsolete, outdated educational system that is still mainstream because of very powerful political financial vested interests. Finally, a solution, because I'm also uh, I'm more interested in solutions. Well, regarding the health uh, workforce, um, I think it is important to realize that, I mean, there shall not be sufficient universities to train nine, soon, nine or ten billion human beings. Uh, this is why I think it is important to turn, this is what we are doing, to customize interactive software. And this shall enable, sooner or later, any patient to become just as competent, theoretically, as the physician. And this shall completely um, reform the basic healthcare system much more deeply than uh, Xavier Prats Monet uh, seems to imagine. But this okay. is going on now. Okay. now that's, that's interesting. Um, thank you. So there was a question there at the back, yes? Uh, so hi. Collect a little uh, bit, uh, no? This is Nagy from Microsoft. Uh, I would like to follow on the topic of AI. Uh, you know, we're successfully engaged in, in the deploying some of the AI algorithms where there of the tumors in radiology or for, I don't know, detecting abnormal heart behaviors in electrocardiographic scans. But kind of following what Petra was mentioning, these are the algorithms that are designed to support doctors in taking the right decisions on diagnosis, for instance. Uh, the challenge, however, that we sometimes notice is that practitioners are not always comfortable that algorithm will advise them something that comes you know, from their own experience. So just wondering how, how doctors are getting prepared for this new way from your perspective. And the second related aspect is the, the policy question on the design on how, uh, from the economic perspective, how such scenarios, so whether it's remote monitoring or whether it's supported decision making, are being captured in uh, the kind of reimbursement or the, the healthcare payment systems. So how doctors can expense the time that it spends using some of their algorithms monitoring more of their patients uh, or you know, teleconsultations. And we see a number of member states that the policy design is not there. So I'm just wondering whether you see the role for the EU to play in kind of spreading the best practices in the policy design here. Um, any last comment or yes, yes, please. <coughs> thank you. I would have, uh, I want to thank all the panelists because I learned lots of things, but I would also have a question. Has anybody uh, thought uh, of uh, devising any fiscal nature incentives uh, to promote uh, prevention in the public at large? Yeah.
Prevent. You just quickly say where you're from also. <laughs> Excuse me. I forgot to say I'm Stelios Christopoulos from Reporter GR. Thank you. Okay, I, th I think that's sort of, um, uh, again, a lot of uh, food for thought. And again, I, I found it interesting that this um, you know, AI aspect came in two questions. You know, um, can we actually at some stage even get rid of physicians and, you know, uh, get the treatment uh, ourselves? So I, I think certainly a very provocative question. But I don't, perhaps we, we start this time from, from the left and, and pair, pair you, perhaps you just pick up whatever you, you, you think you, you want to, uh, to pick up on. So uh, some of the analysis that we, we've been doing is to look at um, what, what is often called the excess cost growth, uh, the, the extent to which health expenditure is rising faster than economic growth. Um, so looking back then, uh, Virtually all estimates point to uh, uh, the, the presence of excess cost growth, that higher growth rate of health-related expenditure than of economic growth. The AI concept totally challenges this, but uh, again, so far, uh, the improved, better, more sophisticated treatments and medicines outweigh the cost-saving uh, effects of uh, technological uh, progress. Uh, so this, of course, is, is, is very challenging, and uh, um, the, the outturn is, um, it's, it's a revolution that is uh, still ongoing, as some of the colleagues here uh, pointed out. Uh, the provocative question of Guntram, will uh, physicians be replaced by um, M-star computers or any other kind of softwares? <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, the, that, of course, requires quite a bit of a cultural revolution, I would expect, because uh, as some other person said in the intervention, how can we replace humans as health workers with robots? Uh, that's not something that you can do overnight, I'm sure, but uh, I'm a bit beyond my own expertise area here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can you say a word also on the, the fiscal incentives for prevention? Because that's, that's actually also an interesting, interesting question. I mean, is our, our health systems and the way uh, sort of fiscally uh, they are set up, are they actually conducive to, to prevention? Or um, uh, is it not considered in most, most healthcare systems? I mean, I don't know if, or, or perhaps that's also for Sylvain a question. Um, um, sorry, I mean, perhaps you, you want to... Yeah. I can go uh, f first on that. Yeah, no. Uh, um, no, I mean, uh, uh, many countries, uh, they use um, um, some form of gatekeeping in order to, 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 to limit uh, overuse and overconsultation. Uh, so that's, um, uh, they, you get uh, consultations through uh, telephone instead of actual consultation of a, of a therapist or a, a physician. So th this uh, type of uh, prevention policies are in place to varying degrees in, in the countries. Certainly it's one way of, of, um, of uh, uh, improving the efficiency of, of, of prevention policies, but um, a, a wide spectrum is needed. I would, uh, I would like to say a few comments on, on two issues. <clears throat> One is this AI and the changes in the labor market, and the second is the measurement that, that, that you raised. So first I admit I know very little about AI, uh, <clears throat> but what I think is, is already we see is that certainly, I mean, a major technological evolution is ongoing for many, many years now. But at the same time what we are seeing is, especially in Europe, higher labor force participation and falling unemployment. Certainly the crisis of 2008 and 9 had, had a, a differing impact, but if you look at the long-term trends, then what we see is basically more people are actually working despite or in addition to this huge technological revolution that we are seeing. So it could be that, let's say, in the future, be completely different than what, what we are facing today, and indeed this AI and all of these robots will be so much intelligent that that after some time they really start to replace on aggregate, because certainly they are replacing workers in a number of specific industries, but on the aggregate, so far we are, we are actually seeing the opposite. And again, I very much agree with many of the panelists that probably healthcare is the, is, is the sector 
in which this will happen the last, uh, because it's about people and, and personal interactions, and people uh, more prefer to have an interaction with a human than, than with, a, with a box. Uh, the second issue is the, is the is the measurement that you raised, <coughs> and you were you were a bit critical that I, I showed life expectancy is, is one indicator. I mean, in a sense, you are both right and wrong. I mean, uh, <coughs> you're right that certainly that that's, that's just one aspect. Though we also had child mortality, which I think is also very much related to the quality of 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 uh, of, of healthcare services and 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 health outcomes. But also life expectancy, I think, captures many, many different things. Because if people are healthy when they are they, they young and grow up, if people are healthy when they, they are in the working age and they are also healthy when they retire, then certainly life expectancy is bound to, bound to go up. Uh, but um, another point is that also the efficiency indicator I showed from, from the work of, 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 of European Commission that considers a wide range of indicators. For example, there is also a, a notion of healthy life expectancy you know, when you are still healthy. Uh, and there are many, many other outcome indicators. So you can, at the macro level, you can, what you can do is always difficult, but you can try to combine different, these more aggregate broad indicators and, and come up with a, with a single number. But certainly they will, they will never perfect. And uh, I know some of us said that, that we need the quality of life, not just the quality of healthcare. Again, that should be also very, another important aspect to consider. Peter, uh, let me turn to you, and perhaps you can also, because we heard uh, breaking down the silos was a point that you made, perhaps you can enlarge a, little, enlarge a little bit more on that. And I was also actually struck in your presentation about your, your point on um, the sexual approach to health data and the issue of data privacy um, and uh, the fact that this could actually be a risk for, for the research. And that was a very short comment, but perhaps you can also enlarge a little bit uh, on that, because I wasn't fully aware of that, so I think people would probably be interested in hearing from you on on, on that. Yeah. So thanks, thanks, Guntram. So on the on the points raised, how can um, new technologies replace doctors? Um, I've seen amazing things um, where you have personal like interaction digitally, not only with remote doctors but also with chatbots or artificial intelligence system. Excuse me, I'd like to react. It's not yeah. t t technologies yeah. replacing doctors. It is the patients, the you people from yeah. uh, who are t who didn't initially train as doctors, who become just right. as competent sure. as the physicians. So this yeah. whole, it's not just the technology. Sure, sure. Which is which is actually also if if you read the um, uh, report, state of the health, patients are still being you know sort of being seen as guided, and the question how much can they take themselves, you know. Take, take care is, is some that could probably be stressed more. Um, on the, on the um, prevention and the breaking down the silos, you know, probably breaking down the silos also helps prevention because in, an, in this economist environment, I would say we have an investment case for prevention, but we don't have a business case for prevention because it's different responsibilities and as soon as we align as incentives, across the system to what good looks like and what we want to achieve, the easier we are going to, to, um, to, to get there. So being in a business, I can tell you clearly what is being measured and what the targets are is being looked after. And as, as long as we are not in such an environment in healthcare which comes close to this is what we want to achieve, that's what we measure and that's what we align our incentives behind, it will always be it will always be difficult, which doesn't mean it have to be economic incentives. It can be inclusion incentives, it can be any any target, but just, you know, making an objective, measuring it and then aligning the incentives across the change is the is the way to break down the silos. Then lastly Guntram to your point on the on the um, sectoral health um, data policy. So health data, uh, when we look at health data, we actually look at health data not in order to target a patient. So it's unlike in Google or Facebook where data is being used also to profile people in order um, to, to sell services, businesses in, in our industry, we look at health data and, uh, and to patient data in order to have the insights on how products work, 
processes work, what are disease space, pathways. So we want to get at all the scientific elements. We also, as an industry, have a magnificent track record in handling health data responsibly because we have been doing clinical trials for decades and there has been hardly any glitch. I'm, I'm not aware of any data privacy scandal we have been having and we are upgrading our technologies to the best possible to make sure that our data pools are not being uh, not being hacked, right? So so there is actually a, a good basis to, to work on and going forward. What we would of course like to do is we have data lakes out there as, as people say. So data are being collected not only in our clinical trials on the medicines, but also in health claims, in the electronic health records. And um, in order to leverage actually the potential of these data, these data must be reused. Reused means these data have been collected for an original purpose. Um, but in the European Data Privacy um, Directive, it's really hard then to have the um, permission to use the data for a different purpose than they have been collected. And this reuse of health data is one of the key levers to get the intelligence out of these data lakes. And it's, it has two tools to get to it. One is um, the research exemption and the research. So for public research questions, you can use data without patient consent. And these research exemptions are not clear how member states actually interpret them. Um, we don't know which types of studies, which types of questions will be included. That's the one point. The second is the broad consent form. So you could also, when patients give their data, um, have broader uh, consent to say the data can also be used for similar questions later on. And also that legal basis is very limited. And these are the two levers where where we believe um, together with data transfers uh, across countries and outside the European Union where, where the Europe could make a difference. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, I would like to respond to your uh, point regarding the fiscal uh, measures. I think indeed it's a very strong and powerful tool and particularly for prevention and particularly fiscal measures around like taxation of uh, unhealthy products like alcohol, tobacco, uh, sugary drinks and so on, but also subsidies and uh, measures and incentives for uh, more healthy and sustainable products. Um, but uh, sometimes it can also s go wrong. That's why I might plead to make sure that we need that we are a bit more political and make sure that our health considerations are taken into account. For example, in the Netherlands, they recently uh, uh, adopted a plan uh, to, for um, um, what was it? Oh, yeah, to raise taxes on all foods, but they missed actually the opportunity to exempt fruits and vegetables from that. So foods and vegetables are now at high price, which obviously have bigger impacts among vulnerable groups. So that's a missed opportunity. Health, the health people weren't there. <laughs> so so that is that is not good. And in particular, people like more vulnerable people are uh, sensitive to um, tax and to prices of, of products. My second point is, I thought it was interesting what you raised, uh, we have to look into the business case for prevention. Um, uh, as long as uh, doctors are being paid or financially rewarded because they are prescribing more or they have more treatments of sick people, you know, that needs to be swapped around so that, they are, that there are incentives that people are maintained healthy. So I think that is something to think through how that can be done. But um, uh, further, in, uh, regarding business models for prevention, I think there is already happening um, uh, out there, there are young people or startups that are thinking through prevention as a business model successfully because they know it's too complicated to engage in healthcare due to the bureaucracy and the standards and criteria. So they stay in a way away from healthcare, but then invest in prevention. So there are business cases to be made, uh, but more work needs to be done for sure. Yeah. Yeah, just a few words reacting to some of the points. Uh, Joel said money matters, but it's not everything. And, and what you said about uh, the um, OECD report on waste, where the OECD actually um, say, uh, estimates that 20% one in fifth of the, of the health expenditure is wasted 
in, in, in the OECD countries. So maybe a lot of this comes from the United States, but I can tell you not only. And actually the OECD lists in that report the type of uh, uh, interventions that in their view is wasteful. And it's actually very interesting to look at that. I encourage you to do that. And basically that says that with the same level of expenditure, you can have uh, much, much more effective systems by doing a certain number of measures um, that we also pr discuss uh, in, in our own reports and in the documents that uh, Per has mentioned and in also in the recommendations we've been making along the years to the member states uh, through the European semester. Uh, how to assess quality, how to assess effectiveness, how to go beyond the usual indicators, mortality, life expectancy. Um, yes, definitely. That's the new generation of data that needs to be put together. Uh, that's uh, Xavier mentioned Paris, the outcome measurement. How do we how do we go one step further in capturing outcome, in capturing the patient experience, and how do we make sure that we get robust systems by which we can. Um, improve uh, the uh, the information for the policymakers uh, to have more qualitative, more effective health systems, but also to make cost-effective decisions uh, in terms of new technologies, uh, as we discussed before. Um, uh, on uh, on the patients. Yes, sure. I mean, the, whole, the way we look at health, health systems traditionally have been looking at the end of pipe. So the, when people are sick, how do we actually treat patients? But health is not just about cure. It's all about prevention, it has been said. So the role of patients, the role of people, because you know, it's, it's not only that you are sick and you need to be treated, but there is a lot you can do to avoid becoming sick. And that is not so directly medicine, or it, but it's health related still. And there is a lot to do there, which goes far beyond what the health authorities have within their remit. And that's where we get into other types of instruments, market instruments, um, fiscal instruments, etc. I mean, at EU level, we, we also do that because uh, there's a legislation on products. I and mean, the most obvious example is the tobacco product directive with very strict legislation on how port tobacco products can be marketed, uh, uh, distributed, and sold across Europe. This, uh, they are uh, market tools and, uh, that are available. Fiscal tools are available for member states uh, to the extent that they are uh, acceptable within the, the functioning of the internal market. You know that some member states are putting minimal prices on alcohol or different type of market instruments this way, taxes, and so on. Um, and I think that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, I, I think uh, it's for me to thank um, all of our panelists for a very rich discussion. And I have to say I very much um, enjoyed sort of zooming in into a sector that macroeconomically, of course, is important, but that has many, many other implications, of course, uh, going well beyond macroeconomics. Um, and I, I think sort of um, this kind of sort of more quality of public finance or structural discussion, I think, is, is actually going to gain an importance in the, in the next couple of years. I mean, we, we're sort of moving away from the immediate macro discussion that we've had in the last few years where sort of we, we're debating how do we get uh, market access for Greece and these kind of things. Um, so, so now we are... We are getting, uh, I think, to the more structural um, public finance, uh, efficiency of public spending, uh, outcome-related measurement of, uh, of, of public spending, um, and so on. And so I think that was a very, very good start of, of that kind of discussion. So let me thank all of um, our panelists, our keynote speakers, and, of course, the audience for engaging today in the discussion. Thank you very much.